So thank you very much for inviting me here. And I hope that um, well, it was not uh, quite clear to me. And they suddenly told me that I have to give a talk. I've been talking for a long time now. So um, now I'm uh, getting a little old these days. I tend to forget things. So will somebody remind me of the date today? 29th of February. Now, does uh, February always have 29 days? No. Then why is today the 29th of February? Leap year. Leap year. What is a leap year? You jump, you leap. <laughs> what is a leap year? A little louder, please. Or will somebody give her a mic? One which is divisible by four. Now, if I think of the Vikram Sambhat, will that give me a proper leap year? Or if I think of Shak Sambhat, will that give me a proper leap year? No, you are talking of a specific calendar. Which specific calendar are you talking about? Gregorian calendar. So let us be clear. Let us not just use the word Gregorian. Gregory was a pope. He was a high priest. And this is the Christian Roman religious calendar. It started off as the religious cap. It started off as the calendar of Romans. It was called the Julian calendar. And then at some stage, when Christianity started ruling the Roman Empire, it adopted the Julian calendar as the Christian Roman calendar in the Council of Nicaea. All right, so this is the religious calendar in which you have a leap year. Now I want to ask, is this to do with something physical? What happens in a leap year? Why do you add an extra day? Does something happen which makes it longer, which makes the year longer? Yes, please. Little louder, please. I can't hear you. My hearing is a little bad. The, the festival of Easter of the Christians had to come on a particular date, but it wasn't flying on the date, so they added another year. Another uh, no. Year. Uh, it is correct that the Gregorian calendar... Yes, you have an answer. Every year uh, usually consists of 365 days and quarter of a day. So every once in a four years, uh, every once in four years, one full day comes as extra. So that's called as a leap year. Okay, so we will come back to your question about Easter a little later perhaps. The point that she is making is that a year is 365 and a quarter days. Now what exactly is a year? What is a year? Uh, Mike, please, I can't hear. Or you can come here and... When the earth comes into the same position with respect to the sun? No, that's an imprecise answer. What do you mean by earth comes back to the same position with respect to the sun? Because this can happen in many ways. So which year are you referring to? I mean, please define a year more precisely. Anybody else? The time taken for the earth to go around the sun. But that is called a sidereal year. That is not the year you are talking about. That is not the year used in the calendar. The year used in the calendar is a tropical year or an equinoctial year. Would somebody like to define what a tropical year or equinoctial year is? Time taken for the earth to go round the sun is the time that it takes for the sun to come back to the same position relative to the stars. Therefore, it is called a sidereal year. But the tropical year that you are talking about, there is a distinction between the two years. One year is less than 365 
and a quarter days, one year is more than 365 and a quarter day on an average. Neither year is equal to 365 and a quarter day, but let me have your understanding of an equinoctial year. It is the time from equinox to equinox. Do you know what is an equinox? Day and night. Days and nights are equal, equal nights. Is it a day or is it a night or what is it? It is a time. And unfortunately, you are not taught that. It is a time, a precise moment, an instant. What happens at that instant, if you have seen, is a beautiful pyramid in Mexico, Maya pyramid. It is called the Chichen Itza pyramid. Now that beautifully depicts the equinox using shadows. On the day of the equinox, you find that the shadows come down the steps and it looks like at the bottom of the steps there are serpents. So it looks like the... The heads of serpents and the shadow comes wavily down. So it looks like two serpents have suddenly appeared. It's a very beautiful artistic depiction of equinox in an architecture. But let us set that aside. What exactly is equinox? Equinox, equal nights, it's a time, it's a moment. It's a moment, so it involves something. It involves, it's the moment when the sun crosses the celestial equator. It's a moment. And therefore, the time between two equinoxes can be measured precisely. It is not a day, it can be a fraction of a day. That's what I'm driving at. Whether you use the sidereal year or whether you use the tropical year, they are both fractions of days. That's the point I'm making. But what is the fraction? It is not a quarter. What is the fraction precisely? Does anybody know? What is the duration of a year? Why did they not teach you this? Very basic thing, isn't it? The calendar. So how much is... Yes, please. No? So uh, what is the exact duration of a tropical year or an equinoctial year. Vishu Varsh. And the other kind of Varsh is called a Nakshatra Varsh, sidereal year. Relative to the, that's the sans Sanskrit terminology. Yes, please. So, what is the duration? What is the duration of the orbit of the Earth? And how do you know? Okay, so if it is 365 and a quarter or whatever, it's not a quarter. You need something better than that. And that is not the way it is defined in the Gregorian calendar that you mentioned. 365 and a quarter is on the Julian calendar. Because the Romans were very bad at science. Extremely bad at science. The Greeks were also very bad at science. They tell you big stories about Archimedes and Euclid and Saul, all fantasy. The fact is in front of you that the calendar, which is simple science, how long does it take for the sun to go around? They did not have. They did not even have the apparatus for it. That's what I'm driving at. All right, so I'm trying to ask you, what is the exact duration of the tropical year? Okay, you don't know, let me tell you, it is 365.242 days. Sidereal year is 365.25 some days. One is more than 365 and a quarter, one is less than 365 and a quarter. So 242, that is the point I am making, that somewhere there is a fraction involved. Now, the fraction that I used is a decimal fraction, 242. Where did decimal fractions come from? Can you please express it in Roman arithmetic or Greek arithmetic? 365.242. Can you say it? Forget about doing it. Can you say it? 
Is there any way to say it in Greek or Roman arithmetic? 365.242. No. Where did it come from? This decimal fraction. From Pardon me? From Bharat. from Bharat. So, why do you use the Gregorian calendar then? Not imposed upon you. You are free for 75 years. Who has imposed anything on you for 75 years? We ourselves have imposed. You can't say imposed upon. We have decided. And we have taken a wrong decision. It's not imposed on you by any means. How can we are supposed to be a free country? Did the government impose it? Did we quarrel with the government? <coughs> so let's get back to the fraction. So decimal fractions originated in India. All right, how did they go to Europe? When did they go to Europe? And how come you say you can't write if in Roman numerals, if I want to write, I will write I and then I'll divide by four. So I will write I, V and I'll cancel the I. Huh? <laughs> okay. You can't do that, right? You can't write fractions. Certainly you can't write decimal fractions. So decimal fractions came from elsewhere. They involved a significantly different system of arithmetic. Because what is the error? Point is the Romans did calculus. They called it calculus. What is calculus? Calculi are small, smooth pieces of stone, pebbles. They did pebble arithmetic. They could not do any advanced science with pebble arithmetic. They could not even get a proper calendar. What did the Gregorian reform do? It changed the figure to 365.241 days. How? By using leap years. Every fourth year is a leap year. Every hundredth year is not a leap year. So it becomes 2, 4. And then added one. Every thousandth year is a leap year on the Christian calendar. That's how they tried to get Easter right. Thousandth year. So year 20, year 2000, was it a leap year or not? It was. Lot of confusion at that time. You were probably not born. <laughs> All right. So, a lot of confusion in the year 2000, whether or not it was a leap year. So, it was, but they did not know. It's a wrong figure. Better figure is 242. But the point I am making is, why can't you, because you cannot express fractions, because you have to do things in terms of integers, in terms of whole numbers, therefore, you say every fourth year is a leap year. Because you cannot say in Greek or Roman, those guys did great science. Apparently, but what is the actual science? This is what is called non-textual evidence. You hear stories, you believe them. Archimedes, what a great story. Eureka, he suddenly found something in his bathtub. He ran naked through the streets of Athens. <laughs> a fantastic story. You can't forget it once you hear it. Right? But totally false. <laughs> so, they are very dramatic stories, very great stories. But there is nothing. What is the evidence? Nothing known for Archimedes. There is a parchment which has come from the 12th century, which has been erased. It is what is called a palimpsest. That is a, it is a religious text, parchment, which has been erased. Uh, well, a mathematical text, which has been erased and overwritten by a religious text. Now you use all sorts of advanced technology to find it. But what is the date you give to the parchment? 10th century. When was Archimedes supposed to be? 1500 years before or 1300 years before. How is that evidence for what happened 13 years ago? I will say, see, I will take some text in aerodynamics in English from London, another place, another time, another language, and then say, look, this is proof that, uh, you know, Indians had aerodynamics uh, 1500 years ago. Will you believe it? You won't believe it, right? So you can't just take any fantasy. This is exactly a fantasy about Archimedes. So point is, they had no advanced science and that proof is in the form of the calendar, which is non-textual evidence. You don't have to go to any text. It's a calendar. It's a bad calendar that you're using where every fourth year is called a leap year. Why? Because the Greeks and Romans had no fractions. So where did fractions came from? Where did they come from? They came from India. We saw that. Now, how did they come? When did they come to Europe? Any idea? When did Indian arithmetic go to Europe? 
and how. So Indian arithmetic went to, yes, somebody has an answer? Yes, please. Yes. As of what, what I've heard, uh, the Indian science, uh, science and mathematics went to Arabs and then it went to Okay. Now, when did it go to Arabs? And who are the people involved? So, when trades happened uh, during that time itself. The Sorry? During trade times. Trade. Trade. Trading. Trading, trading. trading. No, 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 no. It didn't go through trade. Actual text, Indian text went to Baghdad in what is called the House of Wisdom, Beit al Hikmah. Beit means house, like in Bethlehem. Beit al Hikmah, and Hikmah means wisdom. Or like Hakim. Hakim is a doctor, is also a wise man. So, Beit al Hikmah. There was a house of wisdom because the idea was that they must acquire wisdom from all over the world. And so they acquired Indian texts and they translated those texts in the house of wisdom, Beit al Hikmah, which was financed by the Khalifa, Baghdad. So translation was financed and because they were they accepted, they thought knowledge is valuable. We don't think knowledge is valuable. Today we are told money is valuable. Why do you study? Why do you do this? You get want to get a degree, you want to get a degree, you want to get a job. So you want to fall in that, maybe you people are different, but you fall in that uh, category. That's what most people do. You want to get, they don't value knowledge. So you only have to give an exam, you want the degree, you don't want the knowledge, so they don't have the knowledge, all right? Which you are trying to correct. They're trying to correct, they're trying to do in your school, they're trying to do in this school, which is a very good thing. Let us hope it succeeds. So we are talking about the Beit al Hikmah, al Khwarizmi. Then from Arabs, it spread to Christian Europe. Europe had two parts. One part was Muslim Europe, which was Spain and so on, Portugal, but until it was uh, conquered by Christians. And the other part was Christian Europe, which was very poor very poor, but involved in trade. The richest aspects were country, were cities, city states like Florence, which traded with the Muslims. Muslims were very rich. They were the richest part of Europe. And they also existed in Africa. So Fibonacci, have you heard the name Fibonacci? Leonardo of Pisa? You heard the name. What is Pisa famous for? Shardily constructed tower. <laughs> you know, it is very surprising if you go and see it, very shoddy. They have another leaning tower. They are very poor at constructing things. Look at the Kutub Minar in Delhi with almost the same period. So beautifully constructed. Right? Lot of difference. But you think it's a great thing, you know, to construct a bad tower which leads. <laughs> okay, now my <laughs> Something wonderful. <laughs> so, they are leaning tower of Pisa. Nearby is Florence. Florence is about 100 kilometers away. It's supposed to be the center of European art because it was the one of the wealthiest cities in Europe. And it was wealthy because it traded with Africans. Fibonacci was from Pisa. And he went to Africa in a city called uh, Bugia. Now, if you ask, what is this Bujia, Google tells you it's a lie. <laughs> lie, lie, L-I-E, lie. So you wonder what it has to do with it. That was actually some, uh, it is a slightly different name, wrongly spelt. But anyway, that is what he describes in his biography. Now, Fibonacci brought this uh, Indian method back. He wrote a book on it, Liberabaki. But of course, there were many other people earlier who had brought Indian arithmetic. One was Pope Gerbert Sylvester, Pope Sylvester II, Gerbert. He was in the 10th century. He made a very foolish mistake. What is the foolish mistake he made? He constructed an abacus. 
because the Roman method of arithmetic, pebble arithmetic, it is about counting abacus on a board. Exchequer, you know the word exchequer, it is about counting money using coins on a board, checkered board from chess. So that's the word exchequer, that is how accounting accounts are kept. So anyway, your Gerbert brought, uh, tried to bring Indian arithmetic, but he got an abacus constructed. Why? Because he thought the only way to do arithmetic was to use an abacus. Do you use an abacus? You don't use an abacus. Why not? What's wrong with pebble counting? Just keep counting pebble. <laughs> what is wrong with pebble counting is you can't get very big numbers. Greeks and Romans had no numbers beyond a myriad. Myriad is 10,000. Its connotation is infinitely long, infinitely big, myriad stars. Because they couldn't count, can you collect pebbles? Can you collect 10,000 pebbles? <laughs> well, India you had lots of big numbers. Yajurveda has a trillion parars, it is called. In the Buddhist Lalit Pista Sutta, you have very large numbers. You have Talakshan, 10 to the power 53. Do you know what of 10 to the power 53? One followed by 53 zeros, big number. You also have 10 to the power 108. One followed by 108 zeros, very big numbers. Can you collect that many pebbles? So the Buddha says this is meant for counting, you know, grains in grains of sand in so many millions of Ganga river. Want to count all the, oh, it's meant for actually counting all the atoms in the cosmos, that number. Talakshan is for counting grains of sand. Anyway, let's come back to Fibonacci. So Fibonacci's book was called Liber Abaki. The point is, Gerbert made a mistake. He used an abacus because he was a teacher of uh, emperors, of the German emperor, he was a pope. Learned man, very learned man, genuinely learned man, but he wrote a book on the abacus because he thought arithmetic can only be done by an abacus. But you don't do it that way. And why not? That's the story of Fibonacci. So Fibonacci understood that the Arabic merchants are very rich. Why are they rich? They are trading. So what is the speciality that they have got? What is the advantage that they have got? They have better arithmetic. Where did they get their better arithmetic from? From India. So he called it Indian method. But we call it Arabic numerals. <laughs> All right. Because that's the way Europeans perceived it. But now the point is, he called these Numbers that they are called to even today, you say you Roman numerals and Arabic numerals. You say that, don't you? Indo -Arabic. Arabic numerals are Indo Arabic numerals. What was the Arabic contribution? <laughs> no, let us be clear that we got the thing from Europe. And what is taught in our existing system, in our universities, in our schools, what is sanctioned by the state by the government in normal schools which are sanctioned by them is the European method or the colonial method which reflects the colonial position and everything. So Europeans got them from Arabs, they called them Arabic, but why numerals? <coughs> they wanted to suggest that it was only the notation which changed, only the way of writing numbers, there's some magic. What was the magic in the Indian way of writing numbers? Magic? Gerbert believed in black magic. He was, he was uh, called a black magician anyway. So he believed in magic. But was there magic? They teach you magic in school how to do arithmetic? No, they don't teach you magic. Now what do they teach you? Simple things, no? No magic. They teach you a different method, not pebble counting. They teach you the place value system. You can get such large numbers only when you do the place value system. But Europeans didn't understand. Florence passed a law against it. Because in pebbles, if you are counting, let us say, Roman numerals, 
So if I take x, x, i, it means 10 plus 10 plus 1, like 2 coins of 10, 1 coin of 1. So total is 21, right? But in place value system, if I say, let us say 201, is it the same thing as 2 plus 0 plus 1? No, but they said it must be. They said this is the way to do arithmetic. So they were very foolish. And we are even more foolish because we imitated them. They told us we are superior. We believe them. And we imitated them. So we say Arabic numerals. <laughs> anyway, so this is the problem. Florence passed a law against zero. They said zero has no value in itself. That's any amount of value. If I have a contract for 21, you put zero at the end, it becomes 210. Put one more zero, it becomes 2100. Put one more zero. How is it possible you are going on adding zero, which is nothing, it has no value, and then you are going on adding a value. So they passed a law. We still follow that law. You write a check. Nowadays, almost dead writing checks. But when you write a check, you must write it in words to prevent this. Now, if you do on the computer, you have to only enter numbers, no words. But on a check, this was a Florentine law because they said these strange numbers, Arabic numerals, are very strange. They are very evil. Anything you can do with them. So they passed a law in 1300 and we still follow it after Fibonacci. But point I am coming to once more is that he introduced these systems, but they were treated very suspiciously because they did not understand large numbers. When Europeans came to India and they found that in India we have a day of Brahma, which is, uh, you know, some billion years. It is 8.64 billion years. He said, what fabulous figures. How can such large numbers exist? They are not meaningful. Even in my college days, I did physics. I had to be clear about what is a billion. Because there was a British notion of a billion, which was a million million. And uh, American notion of a million, billion, which was a thousand million. Now America has one. And so billion is thousand million. But it was not the case in my time. When I was in college. So they didn't have any understanding of large numbers. They didn't have any understanding of place value. Did they understand fractions? We started with fractions. Did they understand fractions? Yes or no? They must have understood something of fractions, no? Some of them at least. We have some fractions in coins and so on. So if I have, uh, let us say, well, now coins are disappearing very fast. The money is devaluing. But if you have, let us say, once upon a time, there used to be coins of 10 paise, 20 paise, and so on. So you could have coins which are supposedly fractions. But what happened in the Gregorian calendar? Why did the Gregorian calendar not say the year is 365 and a quarter days? Or it is 365 and 241 days? They didn't have the decimal fractions well circulated. The people at large did not understand because they were stuck with pebble arithmetic. How do you express 365.241 in pebble fractions? You break a pebble into 241 pieces, <laughs> it becomes so small. You won't be able to see it. You will maybe make a mistake. So you can't do it in pebble arithmetic. And this is what people are familiar with. For example, if you see Shakespeare. Shakespeare, Winter's Tale. Their uh, clown is trying to do arithmetic. He says, can't do it without counters. Because they did all their counting using counters. Jetons, they were called. All right. So they didn't understand fractions. Is there something else they did not understand? How about negative numbers? Can you subtract a bigger number from a smaller number? Don't look at me suspiciously. I'm asking a question. <laughs> you can. What will happen? You'll get a negative number. So Fibonacci said you can't. Fibonacci's book, Liber Rebecca, says that subtraction, you can only subtract a smaller number from a bigger number. Foolish thing, isn't it? So they made foolish mistake. But was he the only one to make a foolish mistake? No. 19th century, it continued. Many other people, I'll not tell you the whole story. De Morgan, person called Augustus De Morgan. He was professor of King's College, professor of mathematics in King's College, London. 
किंग्स कॉलेज और यूनिवर्सिटी कॉलेज लंदन ही सेट नेगेटिव नंबर्स आर इविल या ही सेट दैट एंड ही सेट समथिंग मोर ही सेट हाउ डू यू से दैट माइनस नाइन इज लेस देन जीरो बिकॉज़ व्हाट इज जीरो इन पेबल अरिथमेटिक जीरो इज नथिंग सो ही हाउ कैन समथिंग बी लेस देन नथिंग it is easier to believe in judicial astrology easier to believe in witches that is what he said 10000 times more easier to believe in witches professor of mathematics in university college london very influential professor so many books he wrote he said this nonsense this was in the 19th century even the 20th century people are not sure i don't know have you ever heard of the book by hall and knight on algebra haven't heard I used it as a school text in class seven. It says that negative numbers have no sense in arithmetic, but they make sense in algebra. This is twentieth century colonial text which I studied. So now, the point I am making is that they got it from us, but what did we get? we got the colonial system on the basis that everything colonial is superior and everything indian is inferior that is the central teaching of colonial education you must ape the west in everything like you do in the calendar you did not compare is this calendar that we have got is it inferior or better to the indian calendar did you you don't even know the basics of the indian calendar what is the thing century panchami that is an example of a tithi what is the definition of a tithi yes the phase of the moon so what is the first tithi no let's have a precise definition No, no. Amavasya and Purnima are tithis, but what is the definition of a tithi? When does the tithi change? Point is, they did not teach you the Indian calendar. Why not? Because they said it's inferior, and the Gregorian calendar is superior. Why? Because it's Western. You did not examine the two calendars. You did not see which is actually better. And I am saying that you believe those stories about superiority. without examining the facts in front of you don't have to get into history your calendar is something you use every day it is a very bad calendar how many days does a month have what is a month how can it have 29 days 28 days or 29 days or 30 days or 31 days month is a variable period is it what is it we talked of amavasya and so on what is the month yes <laughs> Sorry, I can't hear. It should ideally have twenty-eight days with the uh, fifteen days of full moon and fifteen days of no moon. Fifteen so, days and fifteen days will make thirty days. How does it have twenty-eight days then? Fourteen, fourteen. Fourteen days, but it's fifteen days. Is it fifteen days, or is it? See again, just as we got confused about the year as a cycle of the sun, we are not clear what cycle it is. A moon month is a cycle of the moon. The word month comes from moon. It is a cycle of the moon. Now, which cycle? There are again two cycles, or more than several of them, but at least two. So one is the cycle of the moon as it moves from day to day among the stars or the move as it moves around the earth how long does that take for the moon 28 days not 28 days Twenty-seven and fraction of a day please don't round it off use a fraction where it's needed <laughs> you can't do science like that in this random fashion 28 days that is why there are 27 nakshatras because a moon spends one day in each nakshatra it takes 27 days 27 and a little more than 27 that is precisely why there are 27 nakshatras so that is called a sidereal month 
the time that the moon takes to complete a circle relative to the stars. What is the other type of month? Cycle of phases. Full moon to full moon, Amavasya to Amavasya. What is it called? Paksha. Paksha. What is it called in English? You are talking in English. <laughs> yes? No. Month. I am asking of a month. The month of Amantas Purnimant is the system that you are talking about. The system, whether you begin from Amavasya, begin from Purnima. I am asking about the month where you are looking at the phases of the moon. It has a very special term. No. Month is lunar. No, it is about the moon. There are solar months, by the way. But anyway. So, okay, Chandramas, lunar month is not, it is a synodic month. The word for it is synodic. S-Y-N-O-D-I-C. Synodic month. What is a synod? A synod is a religious gathering. And why is it called a synodic month? Because the calend calendar word comes from calends. Calends had to be declared by an authority, by a religious authority. The way you declare Eid Ka Chand today. A religious authority has to declare that the moon has been sighted, the crescent, crescent moon has been sighted. Or some other authority has to declare. That is why there was calends. Roman authorities declared that this is the first day of the month where debts have to be settled. The calends. And they laughed at the Greeks because the Greeks did not have any calends. Having calends in the Greek, Greek calends is like the 31st of April. That's the example that some chap gave. What his name? Oliver Wendell Holmes. To speak of the Greek calends is like speaking of 31st of April in modern te terminology. What is 31st of April? Doesn't exist. So the Romans used to have fun. The Greeks have no calends, so they never settle their debts. <laughs> they thought to be settled on calends. So it's very nice. You can take debts and say we'll settle it with the Greek calends. All right. So calends is the first of the month. Had to be declared. Why did it have to be declared? Why was a religious gathering needed? Can't you calculate it? You don't know how to calculate it, do you? Never taught you. If you know the definition of a tithi, you can calculate. But you should know the duration of the tithi. Tithi, by the way, is the time it takes for the moon and the sun to moon to move ahead of the sun by how much? 12 degrees. How do you measure that angle in space? And therefore, a month is exactly 30 tithis. It is not 30 days. A day or a civil day is the time from sunrise to sunrise. Or the time that it comes from noon to noon. So it is not, that's a civil day. Savan din it is called in Sanskrit. So it is 30 tithis, not 30 civil days. Month is not 30 days. But it is 30 tithis. And therefore, to have a scientific calendar, you must have tithis. Because in the Indian calendar, a month is always 30 tithis. Why? Because it is defined as the time in which the moon moves ahead of the sun by 12 degrees. Therefore, 12 into 30 is 360. 360 it comes back to the same position. When do you have Amavasya? When the moon is 0 degrees with the sun. When do you have Purnima? When it is 180 degrees with the sun. It takes 360 degrees to go around. That's a scientific way of doing it. You don't need a sign out. You don't need a religious gathering. You're calculating it. But they didn't have. They were primitive people. But they said, great stories. We are superior. Imitate us and we imitate them. And there we are. You don't know basics of calendar. You've got an inferior calendar. You believe the story. We need a fantasy story. 
the whole point of telling stories is you construct a fantasy world. So they constructed a fantasy world where these wrestlers were great. And when you watch a fantasy, you see there's something called suspension of disbelief in fiction. You listen to, you watch Harry Potter films, you watch. So you suspend all your disbelief about magic. <laughs> you watch Superman, Batman, all fantasy. All fantasy. Now you are watching fantasy films, you are watching as a story is one thing, but you are doing this in everyday life. Because the same principle was applied there. You suspended disbelief, you believed it, and now you think it is true. So you imitate them when the fact in front of you is that they are so bad at arithmetic. Till the 20th century, they are so bad at arithmetic that they could not do basic science. And therefore, the calendar is very bad. You don't need anybody's stories. Just look at the evidence in front of you, the non-textual evidence. You don't need to go into history books. You don't have to believe what so-and-so said. Fact is in front of you. But you need confidence to believe in that. All right, that's the most important thing. And for confidence, you must understand it. You must understand what is the tithi, you must understand what are the motions, then you will be confident. If you don't understand, you say, oh, it's mathematics, you don't know, maybe something, maybe something I'm missing, maybe something, and then you stay in that state of indecisiveness forever. So that is basically the new syllabus in arithmetic that I'm defining. He mentioned geometry. So that's what you're trying to do here in Udbhav that these Europeans made blunders, huge number of blunders. They made blunders about large numbers, they made blunders about zero, they made blunders about place value system, they made blunders about negative numbers. They are extraordinarily foolish. I am writing a book on that, on European blunders in learning math from India. Right? So what should we do? We should imitate them, right? Make they repeat all their blunders because they are repeated in the classroom. The principle of learning, which is called phylogeny is ontogeny. What does it mean? Child, when it grows up, it repeats the entire evolution of the species. When it is a womb, it is in water. Then it comes out, it crawls on the ground. And then when it grows up a little more, it stands up and walks. So it repeats the entire history of evolution of the species. Same way what you are taught in class repeats the history of the subject. How does it repeat? So it goes through, it repeats the European history of the subject because that is what colonizer understood. And what did we understand? The colonizer is superior, imitated. And so what do we do? We imitate all their blunders. That is what makes math difficult because they found it difficult. They found negative numbers difficult. They found large numbers difficult. They found place value difficult. They found fractions difficult. That is why your calendar does not have fractions. They found all this stuff difficult and we just blindly imitate it because we are monkeys, right? We have no brains, we cannot think. It has been imposed on us for 75 years after freedom. It has been imposed on us because we have no brains to think on our own. What a wonderful people we are. What should we do? We need to think hmm? and we need to change. And how will we change? That's what we are trying to do. That we learn from their mistakes and we emphasize those aspects in the teaching of mathematics that we teach large numbers right away. To teach that, we teach the place value right away. I'm just talking about arithmetic. Same thing happens in algebra, it happens in calculus, it happens in trigonometry, it happens in everything, geometry and so on. I'm just talking about arithmetic. So we teach negative numbers. Why do two negatives make a positive? They didn't understand this and negative numbers are evil, they don't exist. So foolish, so stupid, why should we imitate them? Why should we ape them? You heard the story of the monkey, the cap, cap seller and the monkey? Yeah, so that's what happens when you imitate. You can be easily made a fool. So do we want to be easily made fools? At least make it difficult for the chap. No? And now you're not, <laughs> so you're not bound by any force. Okay, thank you. I think I spent talked a lot. Any questions and so on? If you want, I'll ask. Yes, please. Um, this, when you ask about the moon, how long it takes to rotate on Earth? You said it's twenty-seven point something. Yeah, yeah. Um, if that is the case, then 
how does it 23.5 nearly huh 27.5 5152 five, something like that how does um how how do you overcome the fractional part of that and how how is it that 30 pithis so is that why we are taking the relation of the moon and the sun together i'm sorry i didn't understand your question one part is the question about the sidereal month the sidereal month is a fraction some 27 point some five something all right so there are 27 nakshatras that is how you observe the motion of the moon in the sky the motion of the moon is not the daily diurnal motion not the day to day motion but the motion from one day to another it's very important to understand what is the difference day to day it moves from east to west because it's the rotation of the earth it makes it appear to move the sidereal motion you are, you are talking about it moves from west to east Sun also moves from west to east, sidereal motion. But you can't observe it because you can't even see the sky. And you are not taught about it. You are taught the calendar, the Gregorian calendar, the religious calendar, superior religious calendar. So now what is your question? Sir, um, basically, what I understood is that the Gregorian calendar was not able to um, take the fractional part of that. No, it was not able to define a month at all. They were completely unscientific people, 100% unscientific. And we do not have the capacity to say that the West is unscientific. It did not, in, not only not invent science, it did not understand basic science of astronomy. So, and that is part of the system. Yes. So what I'm saying is, just as they had a problem of taking 365.242 and then turning it into, uh, into, a, into a non-fractional part, no, 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 no. They had problem. We had fractions for the sidereal period. Okay. All right. There was no problem in dealing with fractions. But for the tithi, we had a different method. Now, if you want to convert tithi to civil day, you will encounter this problem with fractions in arithmetic. So that, that was my question. That is that why it is that the moon with respect to the sun and the angle. By which no, it's a very moon. elegant. It's a very, very elegant definition where you are looking at a physical phenomenon, how fast is the moon moving as seen from earth, how fast is it moving relative to the sun. So when it has moved ahead by 12 degrees, and how do you measure, I, I didn't, nobody answered that question. How do you measure this 12 degrees in the sky? Because it's not an angle on paper. You don't have a protractor. So we'll come back to that. So this is an elegant device for keeping track without the means of a synod. So the definition makes sure that there are always 30 tithis in a month. All right. So that is the definition of a month. It is not 30 days. It is not 29 days. It is not 28 days. It is not uh, whatever number, 31 days, etc. That is because they copied the calendar and they did not understand it. And we repeat that mistake by saying the chap who copied is the superior fellow. He boasted he's superior. He must be right. We are, can't check. He is boasting his superior, we can't check, and so there we are. So now you have an elegant device for calculating the synodic month without calling a synod. The month in phase, the chandra mass as it is called, you have a device to calculate that. Now, what is your question? I don't understand. So that was my question. That is, is that why we went to a sun plus moon relative motion? No, it is a relative motion. So it's a, it is the way because how else do you calculate phase? Because phase is the relative position of sun and moon. When they are 180 degrees apart, then you have Purnima. When they are 0 degrees apart, you have Amavasya. So it is the relative motion. And therefore, you must have a relative motion. Because that's the nature of the phenomena. You've got a proper scientific theory. It is in the nature of uh, religious phenomena that somebody lays down what a month is and tells you how many days there are in a month and you believe it. Without checking. And say something strange. Oh, you are looking at relative motion. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I hope, did I make it clear or yes. not? Yeah? That was, that was my question. So it is a relative phenomenon. The phases of the moon. Is it a relative phenomenon? Yes, please. I thank you for your kind presentations. Is that said then? Then how do we properly define a month? How do we properly define a month? Month is 30 tithis. 30 tithis. Because if you are looking at the lunar cycle of phases, the synodic month, 
then it is always 30 tithis. So then if we change the current system, then uh, how do we uh, record it? So, uh, in, the, in our day to day... Uh, it is there in the calendar, traditional calendar. You want civil day, you want to know how to relate the tithi to civil day, there is a standard calculation for it. Which tithi are you talking about? So, for example, if you are talking, I mean, you have to relate Ahargan. What is called Ahargan is the count of civil days, which is called the Julian day number system after Julius Caligar, who got the information from India, from Cochin, which was taken to Rome by Jesuit priests. And as usual, he said, you must attach a Christian name to it. It is most important that you attach a Christian name to it. Everything has to be discovered, like India also was discovered by Vasco da Gama. You heard it too? <laughs> Columbus was discovered, I mean, America was discovered by Columbus. Mm -hmm. So you have to attach it because that's the doctrine of Christian discovery, which says that any, the first Christian to come inside of the land becomes its owner. Mm -hmm. So Vasco da Gama was claiming ownership, but they did not have the physical strength as they did in America. Mm -hmm. So, you want to relate it to Julian day number, that's one way that is called Ahargan. So, you want to relate it to Kali Ahargan, you want to relate it to Civil Day, Savandin, that's another calculation. So, there is a calculation to do it for it. And that requires some technical skill. But if you are brought up to believe that no technical skill is required, then you take a calendar, take a printed calendar and read from it. It will tell you the relation of Civil Days to uh, Titi, any of those printed uh, Karl Garnana. Thank you, thank you, sir. Yes, please. Uh, mic, mic, mic. I can't hear you without the mic. Sir, uh, about this uh, solar eclipse and the lunar eclipse, all these things are going to see. Uh, that also they can copy from Indian astrology. First of all, it is not Indian astrology. All right, the Vedanga Jyotish does not have a single statement on astrology. That is the earliest text because Jyotish does not mean astrology. Jyotish means Kal Ganana. It is time keeping. And there is not a single statement. I issued this challenge to the international press 20 years ago when Murli Manoj Joshi, more than 20 years ago, 2000, Murli Manoj Joshi wanted uh, to introduce uh, Vedic astrology in the university syllabus. So, Indian astronomy, let's be clear, Jyotish means timekeeping by the stars and therefore astronomy. All right? Please don't call it astrology. That is an illiterate translation into English. It is like calling yoga as yoga. All right, so something similar, yeah, except that uh, that's just pronunciation. This is meaning has changed. All right, now what is your second question? Uh, please give her the mic. Did they copy from us? No, I don't know whether they copied from us or not. We, I know that we did have a theory of the solar and lunar eclipse, and you find it in every astronomy text. And particular aspect of the theory is Rahu and Ketu. Rahu and Ketu are essential for calculating solar and lunar eclipse. Because how do you calculate solar eclipse? It's not necessary that every Amavasya there is going to be a solar eclipse. And it is not necessary that uh, every Purnima there is going to be, a, I'm sorry, every, uh, uh, every Purnima there may be a lunar eclipse. So, they have to be in the same plane. The moon does not move in the plane of the ecliptic. It moves at an angle of about 5 degrees. So, Rahu and Ketu are the two points, the two nodes at which the trajectory of the moon intersects the ecliptic. And this is very clearly stated in Indian texts that Rahu and Ketu are not demons. There is a text by, for example, Lal in the 8th century, where he will have a chapter on Mithya, Gyan, Nirakaranam. So, there is mythical knowledge, correction of mythical knowledge, where he says, if you believe they are demons, 
lunar and solar eclipses are caused by demons then please explain why different parts of the moon or different parts of the sun are eclipsed at different times please explain why different people see you know so if the, if a demon has eaten he should eat the same parts no matter from where you observe why can it be calculated and so on so there is a calculation of lunar and solar eclipse a scientific calculation which existed but we have demonized it it's all rahu and ketu you believe this you see this is all superstition it's not superstition it is science but we do not have the capacity to stand up to anything that the west says we just crawl before them why do we do that just because they told us stories of the greatest which stories we never take check just because today they have money they won't have it for very long when you people grow up the west is going to be bankrupt it's crumbling it's completely crumbling it's going to be bankrupt the moment the dollar oil uh, pegging of the oil to dollar breaks you go bankrupt already london now you go to britain i call it great burton you see make a lot of noise <laughs> so you know, they are in very deep financial trouble look at france look at i mean look at spain portugal greece in chaos complete chaos how long do you think they are going to last their time is up okay so did i answer your question i don't know whether there was transmission of the eclipse theory from india may have been you study it don't expect me to do everything i know there was a scientific theory here all right and that it involves the lunar nodes and i don't know of any lunar nodes anywhere else all right next question you have a question Where does the Egyptian calendar fit into this? Because they say that the Egyptians yes. uh, invented the seven-day calendar, and that is quite related to the Gregorian calendar. So how does that? Sorry, happen? sorry. Please, please repeat. The Egyptians invented what? Seven-day week. Seven-day week. Okay. And they, they include weeks in the Gregorian calendar. Hmm. And how does that fit into here? Because even we Indians had a week system. We do have a week. We have war. that's part of the panchang if you like it is part of the surya siddhant so the war is a very simple thing seven day because the seven objects which are visible in the sky see if you look at the rest of the stars they are moving in an orderly way the seven bodies are the sun the moon and the five what you call planets the word planet refers to wanderer means wanderer so unlike the rest of the stars which are rotating around because of the earth rotation if you like which are seen to rotate around the earth in a very orderly fashion these seven bodies move in a way which is not so simple and orderly so there has to be an explanation for it all right so you have a war now i do not know that the egyptians invented it from which papyrus are you talking about and they have mentioned in several places including the textbook no no in your textbook all sorts of things can be stated <laughs> that doesn't matter what i am asking is is there any original source which says that in egyptian astronomy you had a seven day week i have not seen this being attributed to egyptians number 1 number 2 the julian calendar as i have explained the julian calendar comes into existence because the egyptians made it and gave it to the romans sosigenes a person called sosigenes made it and the reason is very simple the julian calendar was the roman calendar was extremely bad so the idea that conquest leads to flow of information towards the barbarian conqueror romans were barbarians egyptians were civilized people they had at least unit fractions and so on they had many things they had lot of advanced knowledge but romans were barbarians and therefore they could reform their calendar only after julius caesar conquered egypt you heard the story of caesar and cleopatra you have heard the story so after caesar conquered egypt they got the calendar corrected and how bad was the correction they needed a year of 445 days or thereabouts maybe 448 something i forget the exact figure but they needed an intermediate error with so much of error had accumulated in the roman calendar so the egyptians gave the calendar to the 
to Julius Caesar. And therefore, they made it simple for him by saying, you chaps don't know fractions? Okay, count every fourth year as a leap year. As a leap year. And what is the disadvantage of that? You don't get equinox on the same day. It is right only on a thousand year average Gregorian calendar. And Julian calendar was failed after 100 years. Therefore, since the 4th century, they are trying to reform it. All right. So I'm not sure that it was uh, seven day week comes from Egypt. It could have. I don't know. I have not investigated. But I know for sure that war does exist here. And uh, that is not proof of anything. What they say in your text. All right. You have to check it yourself. Don't quote the authority of the text. I don't accept it. Okay, if you check it and say, I found it here because of which I believe, then I will take it. All right? Yes, please. Manna, I had one question. Yeah. That uh, we have been taught that a circle is 360 degrees. I have never known the reason why. How did they find out that the circle is 360 degrees? They did not find out. You see, it's a convention. And the convention of one degree is that you are taking a year. Year has approximately three, 365, so you have to do things approximately. So, therefore, you had a year consisting, you have a degree 360. Not a year, no, a circle. I know, but I am relating the circle to the year because it was used in astronomy. Where, what is the degree? How much does the sun move in one day? Not the motion, diurnal motion, not the 360 motion around the earth. But how does it move with relative to the stars? It moves by approximately one degree. If you are looking at the Rashi signs, which are 30 degrees apart, it will move from one Rashi to another in approximately 30 days. So approximately one day, if you want to calculate the time of an eclipse, first approximation will be sun is moving by approximately one degree per day. It's a little less than that. But that's the first level approximation. And then you build all corrections based on that. All right. So the idea was that a degree is defined as the time in which its sun moves by one day in one day relative to the stars. All right. So you have the idea of 360 degrees because it's related to 365 days in a year. That's your question, right? And that's my answer to that. Related to that, approximately that because it's a round figure because you need to divide and subdivide. You need lots of fractions. And so a clean way is to have a uh, number which has several possible divisors. That is why 360. All right. It's used in astronomy. Yes, please. In Uttar Bharat, the month starts with uh, Krishna Paksha, while in South India it starts with the Shukla Paksha. So, uh, is there any social reason behind this or any mathematical reason behind this? Uh, what, uh, or is it uh, two Sanskritis, the difference in two Sanskritis? There it is, is uh, see, there is no mathematical reason where the month should start from. It's a convention. Convention. All right. Now, why one person adopted one convention, why another, why do we wear dhotis in South India, why do we wear something else? <laughs> I, I, it's a convention. All right, so there is no uh, uh, absolute reason for it. It just happened, and somehow this practice got spread there, and some that practice got spread there. It, mathematically, it makes no difference. Secondly, we also have Purushottam Mass. After some years, uh, an extra month is added to lunar calendar. Purushottam Mass or Adik Mass. Adik Mass. Uh, yeah, that I always fail to understand what it is like. You see, you want to keep the solar and lunar cycles in place. It is not a lunar calendar as it is called. It is a wrong term because this is a polemical term. You must understand, beware of Western polemics that you call it a lunar calendar. It is not. It is a lunisolar calendar. All right. So lunisolar calendar means you are keeping the cycle of the moon, which is the month, in phase with the cycle of the sun, which is the year. So how do you keep it in phase? So cycle of the moon, if you take 12 months, 12 lunar months, 12 chandra mass of 30 tithis each is about 354 days. Whereas the cycle of the sun is more than that. Therefore, you have to add months every two and a half years or so. 
every two and a half years or so. And uh, the Greeks got it very wrong. They thought it was a month of 13 civil days and that you must add every month, uh, every two years. And therefore, the learned Solon said that a year must have 375 days. This is how the Greeks thought of a year, 375 days to keep the seasons back in place. But the Adik Mas system is to keep the two in phase. So let us say you have Sankranti when the sun moves from one Rashi to another Rashi, that one constellation to another constellation, the 30, I, I mean, there are 12 constellations, 30 degrees in the sky. So you have 12 constellations. Now when it moves, sometimes it can happen that there is no Chandra mass. See, that is called or can also be called a solar month. Sometimes it happens that there is no Chandra mass. Then to keep the two in phase, you add an Adhik mass. There is also a Kshay mass, which is much more rare. It happens about once in 140 years or so. When you have more than uh, uh, one lunar month in a solar month, as defined here. And therefore, you drop that and so forth. So it's a matter of keeping these solar and lunar cycles in phase. It's a scientific way of doing it. All right? Sir, Namaste. Yeah. Uh, I just have this question I've always had. That's why I'm asking. Uh, when we celebrate uh, Rama's birthday, we say it is Rama Navami. So the Tithi is taken as the basis. But when we celebrate Krishna Janmashtami, we take Rohi Nakshatram as the way to uh, establish his birth date. Now, we as humans, uh, when we uh, try to say the Hindu uh, nakshatram birthday, we always take the nakshatram to say uh, today is my birthday. So, should we they consider the tithi that we were born on or the nakshatram? That, that is my doubt, sir. I don't know. I think that uh, both the things are closely related. So, if you see the Vedanga Jyotish, it has got nakshatra, but it does not have any rashi. So Rashi, a constellation, is something that came later because it is there in the Surya Siddhant, it is not there in the Vedanga Jyotish. Tithi is there in both places. So what you want to do, I mean, I suppose it's just a matter of convention what you want to use because ultimately what is Nakshatra going to do? It is going to determine the position of the moon. And uh, Tithi is going to determine the relative position of moon and sun. Since it's a lonely solar calendar, you should actually use always the relative position. And the nakshatra is only just to keep track of what is happening. But there may be, I have not studied the issue, I cannot say. Maybe you think about it. I can't answer, I have no ready answer to your question. Sir, so, uh, you can take let it let's ask let's ask let's see some let's see what the extent of interest i'm fascinated by the questions yes so I was wondering that where are you <laughs> yeah okay yeah you're so small that is why i could not talk you okay yes go ahead Yes, of course. You see, when you say longer and shorter, when you are talking about time, what is your measure of time? So, if I am using a mechanical clock, for example, it could be longer or shorter. There is no question about it. Whichever way you define the month, I mean, forget about the unscientific way that the Romans and Europeans defined it. But even if you define it using a tithi and you want to have 30 tithis, the duration is not fixed. Something, some tithis can be longer, some can be shorter. Therefore, some months can be longer, can be shorter. So that is perfectly possible. But still, you have a system of calculation, which is based on the tithi, which is a very good system. 
So it is not just based on the motion of the moon alone. What you are thinking of is that it's moving in some elliptical orbit and therefore uh, sometimes that will show in the size of the moon. Size of the moon is sometimes bigger, sometimes smaller and so on. You know, I noticed it when I was a child and then I was told, no, 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 it's always the same size. Doesn't nobody eats it up, but that's <laughs> wrong. It does keep changing in size. So that will happen due to the elliptical orbit. But of course, yes, the time period will also change. But that is not about the orbit you are talking about. The orbit will give you the sidereal month. You are talking about uh, the T. You are talking about the synodic month. So that period is also variable. There are no fixed time periods. Because how do you define time? I have two books on the subject of time. Measurement. <laughs> So that it becomes a little complex issue because what do you mean by two instants of time being equal? Two intervals of time being equal. It's a vast subject in itself. Little louder, please. No matter what system we use, someone's will always be longer and shorter than ever. Well, I won't say no matter what system you use, because if you take that as a basis of time measurement, then maybe it will be similar. But uh, in general, yes, time periods are all variable. Year is variable. Month is variable. Everything is variable. The tropical year is not a fixed duration. It will go on varying. Not just a month. Year also goes on varying. It can be longer by 30 minutes or so. Not as much as a day. <laughs> not the way to it. Roman calendar, but it can be a few minutes this way, that way. So it will vary. All these things vary. No, but over a lot of time, over a lot of time, the over a lot of time, what will change? Over a lot of time, over a lot of time, it's a little off, it will change by a lot, and over a lot of time, over a lot of time, I'm sorry, what will change by a lot? So, uh, if we say that, uh, because the moon is getting slightly farther, don't worry about it. Look at the basic issues of what calendar you have got. You are thinking of something you read on the internet. All right, you are thinking about it. Think of the basic issue of why you don't know how to count the calendar, how to count the days correctly. So don't worry about these fine effects. They will take their place. You need to understand why your basic calendar, that's what I'm talking about. The moon orbit, you are thinking of the physical orbit of the moon, which is the least relevant thing for the calendar at the moment. The variations in that, you are talking about a very fine point, whereas yeah, I'm saying the basic attitude, you do not have a proper calendar today. You have a month which has got 29 days, 30 days, 31 days. Why? Because the moon is moving in its orbit. So you think of that problem because you have done bad mathematics, because people who had did the, made the calendar had very bad mathematics and you are copying them. So what needs to be done to change that? I think that's the central question and not the precise nature of the solar orbit, or, or, or planetary orbits, or lunar orbits, or anything like that. Those are very minute points, which are of no interest in the context of the calendar immediately. So you're not making a lot of time means how many years? How much variation? You need to spell that out, no? Million years? Why should I be concerned about million years? Why not about what is happening right now? Why should that be of such great concern to me? Everything is changing. Everything is changing every moment. Any other questions? Just one last question. Yeah, yeah, I think I can keep. I, I'm interested in the questions. Yes, please. Where's the question? Um, when are you, how do we get your books? Because we know your books, but they're not available in which books do you want? Uh, for example, Raju Ganita. You get it from me. Okay. It's only a draft, still. yes. There's a form you can fill in. So we studied algebra, trigonometry, but I don't know how to use it in real life. 
and what is its actual use? And also the other question was, how did they arrive at that wild decrease, which is then you will tell us uh, later on. The decrease measure. 12 degrees, the idea to have 30 tithis in a month. Now you want to know general use of algebra, even al Khwarizmi gives some use. He wants to define, decide inheritance, for example. It's used in many places. Trigonometry was used for a lot of things in India. For example, to calculate the calendar, to calculate the motion of the planets. For example, trigonometry, I need to calculate the size of the earth. Why don't they teach you how to calculate the size of the earth? These fellows didn't know how to use trigonometry. I used to teach it in my course on history and philosophy of science. I took students out, taught them how to measure the size of the earth. You need trigonometry for that. To first measure the size of a hill, you have to climb the hill and measure the dip of the horizon. Or you go to the, this requires that it should be near the equinox. It should be near the equator. Otherwise you have to make correction for that. So you were never taught these skills. That is why. Because you imitate colonial system. So don't blame algebra or the subject trigonometry. The word trigonometry is wrong. It's not about triangles. It's about circles. But those fellows didn't understand. The very word sign is wrong. You know where the word sign comes from? Jeb. Why Jeb? What has this got to do with trigonometry? Why don't you do it as a project? Well, I'm serious. I'm very serious. Because J was a misreading by Toledo translators of the word Jiba. And the word Jiba was the Arabic translation of the word Jiva, which was used for sign in India. Ja, Jiva, Adha Ja is what Aryabhat calls it. So that's related to a circle. But they said jiba because there is no worse sound, they made it jiba. And they wrote without nuktas, which is the vowel in between. So they wrote just a consonantal skeleton, j and b. The Toledo translators were Mozarabs and Jews. So they did not understand what this j and b is. So they said it must be a word of common use, j. They said sign and you say, oh, you are superior, sir, you are, we are, uh, we are inferior, so we will also use sign. We will not use our inferior turn jiva. How foolish can we get just because of some stories, absolute fantasy stories, which have no basis for which you have no evidence at all. So it's circle metry. It's about a circle and the word jiva incorporates the notion of the circle. So, and that is very useful for a lot of things, for determining latitude, longitude. Why was the calculus stolen from India? Because the Europeans were bad at it, at navigation. They did not know how to determine latitude and longitude. But it was used for everything, for moving an army. I must know the size of the earth. I must know my latitude, longitude, and so on. So it is used in a lot of places. And algebra is also used in a lot of places. So they did not teach you, I agree, because that's the way Europeans learned it. You look at Brahmagupta, he'll explain to you why it is needed. So we can teach it differently. Yeah, some urgent question here too. Namaskar. I have a question. Uh, I'm looking in that side. Where are you? Okay, right. Okay. I'm sorry, there's a lot of glare from there. So my eyesight is not so good. So I can't identify you. He's, okay, now I can see you. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, my question is, uh, I, I have understood that uh, our uh, system of calendar, whatever uh, we are trying to learn, uh, is more scientific than what we are actually following. So now, if I start implementing, or I don't know how to, what is the process that we need to follow to implement this, or bring it into practice about uh, Indian system of uh, um, calendar system or whatever that we actually follow, but the uh, university has to be accepted and the children should understand the um, importance of it and how to go about all this is my question. And uh, since we usually we follow the day day and night, children uh, will ask a question like the day starts from the sunrise and the day sets with the sunset and uh, 
we are so accustomed to it but uh, our hindu calendar it starts somewhere in the mid of the day or mid of the night or uh, how to convince such kind of things with the children and we actually if, we, if i start imagining we start following the hindu calendar our, uh, our ancient calendar. Now, first of all let me correct you the day starts at some random point I said repeatedly, there is a Savan Din, that concept exists in Surya Siddhan. Please look it up. So before you talk of Hindu calendar, Surya Siddhan, first of all, it should not be Hindu calendar, it should be Indian calendar. But anyway, because Buddhists also use it, Sikhs also use it, Jains also use it. It's a very illiterate Western term to call it Hindu calendar. Do you talk of Christian arithmetic? You should talk of it. So it's an illiterate term used by the West. Do Sikhs follow a different calendar? Do Jains follow? You have Buddha Jain, Buddha Purima. You have Mahavir Jayanti. They follow the same thing. So why do you say it's specifically Hindu? It is not. Same calendar is followed by large number of people. Next point is you are saying how to implement it. How to implement it? I have just one word. You have to fight. Because you are dominated. You are fooled. You were told all sorts of false stories which you have not corrected. You believed all those false stories. You have to fight to remove them. You have to fight to explain that they are false and that you do not have this sense of superiority. If you just stay stuck to Hindu calendar, you will not succeed. You have to fight against the idea that West invented science. It did not. They just took false credit for everything like Newton took false credit for the calculus. Completely false based on religious doctrines. You have to explain that. If you won't explain that, if you just stay stuck, this is my tradition, I want to know, I don't care, I'm not going to fight, I'm not going to take any conflict, I just want to do this, you will not succeed. Because their attempt is to dominate you, they have succeeded in dominating you for two centuries. And 75 years after independence. How did that happen? Think about that. How was that mental domination achieved by telling all sorts of false stories? If you don't contest them, you will not succeed. That's one thing. Second point, if you want to change, you have to understand. You have to understand astronomy. If you want to talk of the Indian calendar, if you don't understand astronomy, you will not be confident. Anybody will say something, you will, maybe he is right, I don't know, like doing mathematics. Oh, this fool did not understand negative numbers. How can that be? They say, maybe I don't have it right. So you have to be very sure. You have to check and check and check again. Check, check, cross check. That is my formula. Only when you have checked it very thoroughly will you be sure enough to stand up against authority and fight. Do I make myself clear? Louder, please, louder, louder, louder. No, you can't start by saying, I can't keep writing books all the time. I am writing some books, but you know, somebody can help me out. You think all the job is mine? I have written so many books, but nobody takes, it's not enough to have a book. We want to take your books. You take it. There are so many of them. We check online, we couldn't find. You check, you will get plenty of pirated copies online. <laughs> Yeah, you check my website, tell me what book you are not getting and let me know. Okay, ckraju.net. You can check my website. Yeah, there is one hand here. Sir, how do two negatives make one positive? Ah, very nice, very nice question. Yeah, you did not understand that or you understood it? Does anybody else want to answer the question first? So you can answer the question in various ways. Supposing you lose debt. I have loss of debt. Does that amount to gain? Supposing you have a debt of 100 rupees to somebody. You lose that debt. Have you gained something or not? Array, you bought something. Let us say you bought a car. And all these chaps are offering you loan. You took a loan. Now if you lose the loan, the bank withdraws the loan and withdraws the claim on the loan, 
So, have you gained something or not? You have gained. You have gained. No? That's all. Loss of debt is gain. So, negative number is rin in Brahmagupta's terminology. It is debt. All right. Another description that is given is by Bhaskar, which is that negative number is in the other direction, what you call the number line. So, it is in the other direction. So, what is the other direction of the other direction? It is the same original direction. So, two negatives make a positive. Thanks. All right. Hmm. Namaste. My question is uh, related to uh, Madam. I can't. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. My question is very much related to what Madam is talking. If we know that our calendar is superior, uh, do you think, like, from a world point of view, is it possible to implement it now, specifically in connection to the uh, how dates and calendars are so related to world economy? Do you think is that something possible, and what would be the impact? And See, why does the world economy come into the picture? Because you want to use your calendar. Let us say your tithi. All your festivals, all your culture is based on what about the Easter festival? What was this Easter festival? Easter festival, it is some uh, miraculous uh, rebirth of Christ celebrates that, the miracle of the rebirth of Christ after he died on the cross, supposedly died on the cross. I mean, not a real figure, but that's the festival. All right. So, in that festival, you are talking about uh, something. Why? It was a political purpose. The political purpose was that different people, different churches in the Roman Empire were celebrating Easter on different days. And if they celebrate on different days, they are not united to unite them, to bring them together, to celebrate one common festival. Therefore, the festival of Easter was decided. All right. You said they decided we are part of the world, so we must follow them. Follow them. Be enslaved. What is my problem? I am not there in the world for very much longer, so you do. <laughs> you want to be slave? Nobody can stop you. So, we don't have to worry about the world economy. Let them worry about us. All right. We can do what we want to do if we are free people. And it's very easy to transform from one calendar to another. Today, it's easy to translate from one language to another. I can follow a Chinese video on Bilibili because I can translate it. So, it is not that you are afraid of offending the master. You must fall in line with them. They don't have to do anything. So that mentality is problematic. One last question. Yes, please. Um, considering that, uh, you know, the time differs from place to place. And uh, I mean, in India as well, if you were to look at uh, more from the, um, what is this, a space point of view or in the sun point of view, the time in the northeast differs from uh, you know, the time in the uh, northwest or south, not similarly. So, do you think having a one time zone, uh, you know, I know there are a lot of uh, you know negatives and positives uh, economy wise, but do you think uh, it makes sense to have a different time zone for different uh, places? For different states yeah. within the country? Yeah. You propose it, obviously, you don't want to have that. But you have such a system in the United States. You have Eastern Standard Time and you have because it's a big country and it is spread across in longitude. So you have Pacific Time and you have New York Time. They are different by about an hour or so. You can have, we had that in India. I remember I was going, early days, Bombay did not adopt the Indian st Standard Time. So I was going by Punjab Mail to Bombay. And I said, what is the time and what is the time in the timetable I was checking? And I said, the train is late by one hour. And somebody said, no, it is going to arrive on time. Why? Because the clock will have to be reset when you go to Bombay. Because they still follow their local time. 
So it's perfectly possible to have, but that's a matter of convenience. It's not uh, anything else. Yes, please. Thank you, sir. Sir, uh, we're introducing you to the uh, audience here. Uh, uh, she said that uh, you had a challenge uh, uh, saying that one plus one is equal to two. It has to be proved or something like that. Can you please throw more light on that? Yeah, this is in a lecture in JNU. It's a lecture, it's on video, and it is in front of the chairperson was the UGC, who is today the UGC chairperson, at that time the vice chancellor of Delhi University. It is called, How Should We Teach uh, Statistics for Humanities and Social Science? Because JNU is a university on humanities and social science. So how to teach statistics? Should we use normal math or formal math? That is the title. The video of that is available on uh, my website or etc. various places. It's available on my YouTube channel and so on. Now the question that is involved is, my point is that real numbers is something that is taught in class 9 text. It is the first chapter of the NCERT class 9 text. Nobody understands real numbers. And therefore, my question was prove challenge was, it's called the Cape Town challenge because I first posted in Cape Town. So I said that you prove 1 plus 1 equal to 2 in real numbers without assuming any theorem from axiomatic set theory. Okay, that is the caveat. And the example I gave was that Bertrand Russell in his proof of 1 plus 1 equal to 2 in natural numbers takes 384 pages. So question was why? Because you do not understand, most people do not have the foggiest idea of the nature of formal mathematics, of the horribly demonic nature of formal mathematics. I am saying that I have a PhD in it. I taught the subject for so many years in Pune University and I am saying that now. I was also fooled. Nobody has the slightest idea of how complicated 1 plus 1 equal to 2 is. Therefore, I offered a challenge prize of 10 lakh rupees. It is there on video. It is there on my website. If you like, I will give you the exact link. And there is a presentation also online where everything is explained. That also is available online. Then I said that, all right, you can't do it. In one week, time is not enough. Then you reduce. I will... You take, uh, I'm sorry, one day is not enough, take one week. I will reduce the price to one lakh. Nobody accepted the challenge. That's the important point. Nobody accepted the challenge. Nobody has till now accepted the challenge anywhere in the world. Then I said, if you don't have that, you say, professor of mathematics education does not know why 1 plus 1 equal to 2. Hang a board outside your room. Give your designation, professor of mathematics education. I don't know why 1 plus 1 equal to 2. That was my substance of what I said. Do you think it was unreasonable? <coughs> Either accept the challenge or do it. Say you don't know 1 plus 1 equal to 2. You are teaching mathematics education. Education. How should mathematics be taught? You are telling everybody. You don't know what is 1 plus 1 equal to 2. That's the state of affairs in the country. JNU is our premier university. So the video is available online, what I am saying, you can check it out and you can take the link from me or just search on Google, you will get it. Statistics for social sciences and humanities. So we don't know, we keep teaching because our only thing is we must ape, we must ape, we must ape, we must ape. And you have become apes. You don't know 1 plus 1 equal to 2 but you cannot change it in the class 9 syllabus. So it's a very sad state of affairs. You are mentally conquered. You are men mentally subservient. You say whatever comes and why do you need real numbers? For calculus. And I'm saying you don't need because the way calculus developed in India, you don't need real numbers. And statistics, by the way, is needed for your artificial intelligence. I have another article on that. You can take a look. What has happened in California? So it's needed for technology. But we follow, we ape, we ape, we ape, because studying is aping, passing examination, 
not understanding. It's all right if you don't know why 1 plus 1 equal to 2. And everybody else will condone it. Math is tough. Are bichara professor hai to kya hua? He doesn't know 1 plus 1 equal to 2. It's all right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, where's the mic? Yeah, go ahead. My question is related to Adhikamasa. Yes. And uh, when we say Adhikamasa, generally, uh, I don't know what to do, but particularly in South India, we do a lot of auspicious things, spiritual things, and we relate that to number 33. Uh, we do Namaskar, uh, 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 our elderly people say, do it uh, in 33. Uh, whatever we offer, say we do sweets. Uh, can I interrupt you? Please, please. I am only talking about Jyotish, the scientific aspects of Indian timekeeping. All right, not for the Jyotish or the astrology or what is auspicious or what is inauspicious. So I will pass that question. Come, I'll pass that question. All right. My question is, how is it related to number thirty-three? I am saying there is. I don't know. This is all some thing which is part of for the Jyotish, which I am not talking about. Since I am specifically excluding Phalit Jyotish or Astrology from what I am saying, therefore, I will not take up that question. All right? I am sorry. Yeah, any more questions? Anybody? Looks like you have got exhausted before I have got exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> okay then. Thank you very much. Yeah, you have a question? Okay. Yes. Sir, uh, like lots of things what we were following, I think today that we are completely in wrong track. So I just want to confirm whatever the time system we are following, is that correct? No, it is not. Because if you take the Indian time system, it is fully sex adjustment. So, if you take a day which is divided into 60 ghatis, it's so a scientific science. Indian systems are all scientific, Westerns are all unscientific, all influenced by the church, deeply influenced by the church, including the mathematics. So, we have 60 ghatis, and each ghati is 24 minutes. In the Western system, you have 24 hours, so the system is gone, and then each hour is 60 minutes and 60 seconds for each minute. Here we have 60 ghatis and 160th of that is a vighati and pal and 160th of that is a vipal and so on. So that's a scientific system, it's a sex adjustment system and we have had that system of timekeeping. So therefore if you ask me which system is better, obviously the Indian system is scientifically better. But our logic is not, our logic is those guys are the masters, we must follow them, we must be part of them and it's a different matter. We are not asking what is scientifically better. <laughs> You are asking a different question in that case. Am I clear? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So very much thank you. And yeah. if you can cite a particular, uh, like where we can get this uh, details of this uh, and uh, subdivision so that I Well, can... I can give you a book. You see, if you go looking on the internet, you will find everything about Falit Jyotish. All the, because astrologers make money. Exactly. Scientists don't make, especially people who are working on this, they don't make that kind of money. Mm -hmm. Right? So you'll find everything in the internet full of Falit Jyotish. But they will also talk about it. But you will take this, you find, look in the Surya Siddhant. So go to original sources. I am conducting a course on the calendar. That's the first point I teach. That if you want to have any authentic information, go to the original sources, go to the Vedanga Jyotish, go to the Surya Siddhant and so on. And don't go to the internet. Easy to type on the internet, but you will get junk information. Lot of information is unreliable, thoroughly unreliable. So please have the discipline of consulting the original text, reading them and understanding them. They are difficult, but that you need to do if you want to understand. All right. Thank you, sir. Um, so this is. Uh... I have gone through your YouTube video on the formal approach in mathematics, which is adopted by Western mathematics. Um, also by Indian mathematicians. Every Indian mathematician with a PhD is doing formal mathematics. Yeah. Yes. So, um, my question was, you have compared Ganit 
which accepts different kinds of pramanas including pratyaksha praman upaman etc no it doesn't necessarily accept upaman uh -huh. pratyaksha praman is the one thing i'm talking about uh -huh. so so you said that ganit is different because it does accept pratyaksha praman mm. and unfortunately um, you know western mathematics has gone into some self uh, you know it is a church political strategy to prohibit the empirical because the church does metaphysics it has not unfortunately gone into it it has gone into it with open eyes to politicize and then to say what we did is superior hmm. so that it is able to fool lot of people and then dominate and control the content of mathematics hmm. it is not unfortunately it is a political strategy deliberate political strategy to fool their own people and fool us so now what pratyaksha so praman is prohibited in formal mathematics this is there as part of the class 9 text please read the appendix ncert text so my question was um if for example you move away from formal mathematics as proposed by western uh western church 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 so use the word church. correct word church yeah so is there any other differences which you see between the ganit of india and the the formal uh, yes so i would like big difference as i said for example is in teaching of calculus so brahmagupt used what is called non archimedean arithmetic so calculus was understood differently in india but you have to use real numbers in teaching calculus on the western technique but real numbers are only have a formal existence they do not have real existence they are unreal numbers the metaphysical numbers all right that's the point i am making when i talk of 1 plus 1 equal to 2 in real numbers but it becomes very difficult for me to talk because nobody understand nobody knows what a real number is it's all part of our school text but you don't read it and you don't ask and you don't ask if i don't understand what is what is the matter you say something wrong with me if i don't understand and you have finished right there you don't think something wrong with the text you don't think something wrong with the subject something wrong with me that i don't understand that's what i said about having confidence about what you're saying being right investigate it but when you absolutely don't understand ask about it and if nobody answers you then you know what you're doing so there is a difference there's a difference in very many situations the difference for example in geometry they will be teaching that in rajju ganit you don't do it formally you do it practically yes so there is a difference at every stage there is a difference in trigonometry and so on there is a difference at a level of science major differences i have written about that also Sir, uh, we talk about time. I mean, and, uh, in terms of how many years of uh, evolution, etc. Uh, and uh, AC and BC. Now we are using it in a different way. CE and BCE, kind of that. Uh, and the modern science says uh, it took the sixty-five thousand years back that actually human people like we uh, humans walked this earth. Uh, but if we uh, talk about the time of Ramayana and Mahabharata and all that, uh, they talk uh, much uh, earlier times. So how to comprehend this? Sir? I'm sorry. Are you saying that Ramayan and Mahabharata are much earlier than sixty-five thousand years? What are you saying exactly? I'm trying to understand. Yeah, yeah that, that's the reason. Because they say about I mean, actually Ramayan was twenty-five uh, Kali Yuga, and uh, I mean, uh, Kali Yuga is uh, yeah. not so far back. Kali Yuga is minus uh, three thousand. We are talking about. I don't use the word CE. Except because it is confused with uh, Christian era, yes, sir. common era and Christian era yes, are confused. So Christian era is all right; it's honest. Common era is dishonest. All right. So I'm not using that. I'm using plus and minus. After all, we have negative numbers. Europeans got confused. Let them get confused. Let them say you must talk before uh, Christ or after uh, whatever. I'm using the word minus. Yes, all right. So. So we are talking about 5,000 years ago, approximately, for the Kali era to begin. Now, what are you talking about? No, what is the then? Uh, what is the time with which Mahabharata, Ramayana, Bhagavata? So they are all after this. Uh, even in the traditional sense, 
if you look at uh, Mahabharat war, the most traditional date is that uh, Kali Yuga begins with the death of uh, Krishna or with the beginning of Mahabharata, whatever, somewhere around that time. It's a few years, you may be 30 years more or less, but nothing to do with 65,000 years. So Kali Yuga is linked to the Mahabharata epic, even in, uh, in an understanding of it. So Mahabharat put it 1,000 years earlier, uh, Ramayana put it 1,000 years earlier, 5,000 years ago, 7,000 years ago. Yes, yes. So I don't see the problem with, uh, because you should not get into geological eras and uniformitarianism and so on. That is not relevant here. Okay. Thank yeah. Thank you. Okay, so you are all finally exhausted. <laughs> okay, thank you very much.